Welcome to my illustrated lecture, and thank you to the wonderful staff of the Baron Art Center for this opportunity to speak about Ukrainian embroideries. I'm Olga Kolbrin, and I've prepared for you a slide presentation with many beautiful embroideries that will tell their story. I'm now a ret retired from many years teaching here in Woodbridge Township. I'm a first-generation Ukrainian and have always shared the love I have for my cultural heritage with everyone, like my, my sixth grade students who wanted to learn how to make those beautiful Ukrainian Easter eggs, pesenke. And we formed an after-school club which ran for many years. For over 20 years, I've taught pesenke workshops, Ukrainian Easter egg workshops locally, and I include a brief history of that beautiful folk art. The New Jersey State Council on the Arts awarded me a grant to teach my apprentice the art of making pesenke. Later, I became the apprentice to master artist, the late Helen Dolbush, studying the Poltava region embroidery, which we will see today. Uh, today I'll share with you the interesting origins of this folk art from my, pr my perspective as a teacher and a tradition bearer of my cultural heritage. At the end of the presentation you'll find in the credits sources for you to look up and I reference those special people who are truly accomplished, recognized authorities on Ukrainian embroidery and folk arts whom I've been inspired by and learned from. We'll begin the, uh, the art of Ukrainian embroidery. Uh, this beautiful mosaic shows uh, styles of embroideries that are typical for those particular regions of Ukraine. If we begin with uh, an introduction to where Ukraine is and uh, um, all about uh, the Ukraine. Uh, then we go on to our cultural heritage of, uh, and how embroidery is integral to the Ukrainian culture. Um, we will go on to the exhibit from there um, uh, that, uh, that the Ukrainian National Women's League of America has produced at the Baron Arts. Um, I've noted some resources for you. Uh, after that, uh, we go on to ancient origins of embroidery. Uh, from there, Christian influences, then importance in cultural and religious life of Ukrainians. Um, then you will see beautiful treasured embroideries on display. Uh, we will go on to influences of the motifs and designs on embroidery. Uh, then you will see a selection of the types of embroideries and stitches that are used. And uh, we'll end with looking at the regional patterns and designs uh, that go across Ukraine from, from west to east. Um, uh, on the Ukrainian landscape. And finally, I'll end with credits where you can uh, check out some resources and, uh, and so on. Our beautiful Ukrainian embroideries are as, as joyous as these Ukrainian dancers celebrating on stage dancing. Uh, this was, uh, we actually ha now have a Vishavanka day in Ukraine and for all Ukrainians all over the world. Uh, we wear our Ukrainian embroideries on, uh, the, I think it's the third uh, Thursday in May of every year. These obviously are Ukrainian dancers wearing uh, the Ukrainian national costume of a region, a particular region of Ukraine. Uh, now to our maps of Ukraine. Uh, this gives you the idea of where Ukraine is situated in Europe. Uh, Belarus is to our north, Poland, uh, Slovakia, Hungary, and Romania to our east, um, and to our west is Russia. The Black Sea is our southern border. Um, Ukraine is uh, divided into east and west. Uh, the Dnipro River, which travels through the, just about the center of Ukraine uh, from north to and empties into the Black Sea. On the western uh, tip, most southern western tip of Ukraine are the Carpathian Mountains and uh, many smaller regions within the Carpathian Mountain region of uh, embroidery styles and so on. Then uh, we move north to the city of Lviv, which is north central, and uh, then our northern uh, regions, central regions, uh, across the steppes of Ukraine to the west, and then uh, 
uh, the western uh, regions of Ukraine. This map shows the uh, provinces of Ukraine, uh, like in, in France. And as a matter of fact, Ukraine is the size of France in area and population. You see the Ukrainian flag, the blue for the beautiful blue skies, and the yellow for the golden wheat fields of Ukraine, and our trident national emblem. This map is an ethnographic map uh, that shows you areas where the regions are um, not political, but are um, by uniqueness of their, uh, their embroideries, their folk art, their singing, and their, uh, their regional costumes, national costumes. What unites all of Ukraine, though, with all these different regions and their styles are, uh, is the embroidery and how the embroideries are used in, in, in our lives. Uh, this you may wish at, at some point to do a screenshot of the map and, and of this key because this names the regions that are on that map. Uh, you may recognize your family heritage is from one of these regions and you'll be able to picture it on the map of Ukraine. Uh, once again, another uh, map that is ethnographic showing the regions, the swaths of regions where uh, the traditions are similar in the styles of embroidery and, and um, uh, the national costume. The ancient traditions passed down over the ages. And I bring you to my traditions and where my heritage has, has been passed down. My Aunt Anna on the right uh, emigrated to America in the early 1900s, and then my father, the youngest of all the siblings, followed her. Uh, my cousins are on the right. Uh, my family has always been members of the Ukrainian National Women's League of America, so m this heritage in my family goes way back. And other tradition bearers in my family um, uh, came to America as immigrants following the Second World War. Uh, they too were my tradition bearers. They brought with them um, that renewal of our cultural heritage, um, the language, um, and of course, uh, all, all activities and all cultural events and so on were enriched by their presence. The picture on the left is a concert that was given by these uh, refugees in Germany while they were in the um, uh, the displaced persons camps. They had choirs, orchestras, they had schools of Ukrainian studies, and uh, they went to work as well. They learned German um, and brought all of their, their family heritage with them. What little they could take during the war with them, their precious possessions were their embroideries. If they didn't have everything that they needed or wanted in, in, in embroideries, they made them there while they were in those camps waiting to emigrate. Um, on the right is my Aunt Lesha. She and I have spent many hours embroidering. Uh, and so they are, these are my tradition bearers. The Ukrainian Embroidery Exhibit is produced by the Ukrainian National Women's League of America, Branch 98. I'm a member of Branch 98. We are here in central Jersey. We're an American-speaking branch of uh, the national um, organization that is headed, that is, um, headquartered in New York City. We have branches throughout the United States. Um, and once again, the Baron Arts Center has our exhibit, which is in the entrance vestibule, the entrance hall of Baron Arts. And then you walk after enjoying all these beautiful embroideries there on exhibit, you'll go into the main gallery where you will see uh, the two exhibits, one of art, beautiful Petrakilka art, and the other of um, of uh, heirloom uh, Ukrainian rushnike, the, the uh, ritual cloths. Here is uh, uh, exa also examples from the exhibit of men's shirts. We call women's embroidered sh blouses, not blouses, but shirts, and men's shirts as well, our shirts. Uh, these were embroidered by um, one of our members' husbands, mothers, but he was given the, the uh, job because he was so interested in her embroidery and in the beauty of the work. Uh, she gave him she, it, it, uh, the opportunity to embroider all of the brighter colors into the darker background. The two shirts on the, uh, the bottom are uh, those embroideries that he uh, took part in and, and embroidered. 
Here we have costumes that we have had on exhibit, uh, partial costumes uh, and uh, the beautiful blouses and embroideries you'll see later closer up. Here is an array of embroideries that we, we would have in our homes, decorative pillows, scarves to put under a lamp or under a picture, uh, tablecloths or runners for tables, um, a dress that is embroidered, and we treasure the embroideries that we have in our homes and that are passed down to us. Uh, these embroidered pillows at the top left are four pillows that are, were the gift to Walter Cassian and his wife Luba, who is a member of Branch uh, 98. Uh, th the two on the left and two on the right, the pairs, the top and bottom pairs, are from each of their, their mothers. Their mothers embroidered one of the pillows for, as a wedding gift for them and the other pillow for their home, well, uh, their, uh, their new home gift. And these are, are treasured, uh, treasured possessions for all of us to have received our embroideries from our mothers and grandmothers. Uh, we're going to look at some resources for Ukrainian arts and culture that you can explore on your own. Uh, the Ukrainian Museum in New York City was founded by the Ukrainian National Women's League of America in the 1920s and is an absolutely beautiful museum to visit. They offer many, many virtual, uh, both virtual tours, uh, classes, um, lectures. So that's a wonderful source for you to refer to. And uh, something that's been on exhibit. This, these are called sorochke. Once again, sorochke in Ukrainian are our, what you would think of as Ukrainian blouse. Uh, these would be layered. The skirts would be layered, and the blouse part uh, is is in and of itself, um, you know, an important part of the, of the Ukrainian national costume. We now, for us, for our purposes, only embroider as a blouse to wear because we no longer would wear the shirt traditionally the way it is here. Another gem here in New Jersey is the Ukrainian History and Education Center in Somerset, uh, New Jersey. Uh, also take advantage of all the many things that they have virtually online that you can log into and enjoy. Now we come to the ancient origins of Ukrainian folk arts and customs. Ancient rituals and symbols were talismatic. They were rooted in protection from evil they, and in praising the gods and um, uh, wishing for uh, good fortune in the future. So uh, the, it, within the Ukrainian embroidery patterns and motifs are, are those motifs that had uh, ancient meaning and have been passed down to us. Uh, we know that the Greek historian Herodotus, uh, 425 BC, in his writings, in his descriptions of the Scythian cult culture, confirms the origin of the ancient artifacts that have been ex excavated in Ukraine. Um, many of them in the 15th and 16th centuries, and many others since then too. Uh, so we, we can go back to Herodotus and 400 and the 400 BCs for um, an affirmation of how our motifs and, and the symbolism and the meanings have, have been passed down to us today. Here we have ancient artifacts in the red at the top of the, of the uh, screen. The bird on the very, very left is a carving of a uh, bird. We see the top um, view and the side view of the wing and the, uh, the design on the wrist amulet. Uh, these designs were carved in Monmouth tusk. Um, this, many, many centuries ago. And the, on the right is uh, a figure of a woman. And once again, those designs that are carved into mammoth tusk are seen in this embroidery on the bottom left. That's an embroidery from a hundred years ago, part, the cuff of a sleeve of a man's shirt. And uh, we see that very, very similar design that has been passed down and, and, and kept over the years. 
Uh, the Scythian culture is known for their beautiful metalwork in gold and, and silver metal. And in these artifacts that have been found, we, we see uh, the, um, the designs that they use in their clothing or in their other decorations. And this too is a, a real testament to the motifs that have been passed down to us, as well as these artifacts tell a story of how they lived. They're absolutely phenomenal uh, findings that are throughout the world uh, in museums on display. Uh, here we have tri the Trapillion, the ancient Trapillion culture, dating back from 5,000 to the, around 3,000 BC. Uh, on the left, we have um, carvings of in, in bone, and then um, pottery, fired pottery, with their specific uh, beautiful um, artwork. The, uh, the, the picture of the egg at the very top of the screen it was actually an artifact that was found. And that design is found in Pesanque still made today, which this is an example on the bottom of a, an actual Pesanque using the design. Uh, here, once again, this is the Trapillion design being uh, used in, in modern interpretation of a ceramic and an cross-stitch embroidery. As you see, I have to talk about Pesanke. Uh, and these, of course, are part of the history of, of our ancient history. Both embroidery and Pesanke existed at the same times in Ukraine. Their origins are similar in, 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 in time. Um, and these particular artifacts on the right are fired clay uh, with designs that, uh, that have been continued over the ages. The Pesanke on the left are from an exhibit at the Ukrainian Museum. Once again, beautiful um, renditions of the types of designs that have passed down over the ages. Here we have how to make pesanke, also an ancient art form, very, very basic writing with a, a stylus on the egg using wax that you melt to the candle and then go through a dyeing process. This ancient, ancient art has been passed down and we still use this today with those same ancient tools and many and have been modernized, but these are the basic uh, tools that have been passed down to us. My Aunt Anna taught me to make pesanke as a young girl girl and of course beautiful examples. This brings us to Christianity in Ukraine was brought by Saint Vladimir in the year 988. He actually baptized his nation and uh, the ancient pagan rituals that had flourished up until that time of baptism and conversion to Christianity um, all of those traditions and celebrations and rituals uh, could be easily melded into and trans, uh, transformed into Christian meaning and Christian celebrations and, uh, and holy days. And the symbols that we see carried on from this point forward where uh, they may have been uh, pagan symbols now take on a Christian meaning. And that is, we find that both in Pesanke and in embroideries. In the cathedral, the St. Sophia Cathedral, we see the bell tower on the right and the cathedral below um, uh, in cave. We have uh, interior evidence of all the beautiful mosaics and all the beautiful frescoes that still exist show testimony to uh, the embroidery motifs uh, throughout uh, that confirm how they have been passed down from those times through today. And this is a close-up of the, uh, the Oranta. Uh, the Blessed Mother Protectress of Ukraine, and once again her vestments and, and other, uh, other parts of mosaics in the cathedral uh, show testimony to the uh, motifs. We continue with our traditions. I'll sh I'm going to show you beautiful folk scenes of old Ukraine. They uh, captured in the centuries-old Ukrainian art of painting in reverse on glass. And the artist is uh, Yaroslava Surmach Mills. She also is an, uh, a first generation Ukrainian whose parents emigrated to America at the turn of the century. 
Uh, here we have uh, the, the tradition of sitting and, pe and making pesanke before Easter. During Lent, before Easter, we make pesanke in order to have them uh, for our Easter celebrations. In the background, you see icons draped and adorned with beautiful embroidered rushnike, or ritual cloths. And of course, the, the young girls' shirts are embroidered. And we have a woven table covering. Here is another scene of a family at Easter blessing of food. All the food is brought in a basket covered with a beautiful embroidery and then blessed uh, Easter morning and then enjoyed on the lawn of the church, followed by Easter dances to celebrate the coming of spring and the, the birth of new life. And that, as a pagan celebration, of course, is transformed into the Easter celebration of Christ's resurrection and new life. Here we have another painting of um, going to market. And you see um, everyone dressed in their beautiful um, national uh, embroideries and costumes. This is a nice picture, a painting, of um, a wedding of the Poltava region. And if you can check out all those faces, she puts in such beautiful expressions on people and children and animals. And if you look closely, I hope you can see uh, all, of the, uh, all of her beautiful artwork. And here, too, is another wedding from the Boyko region. This is a western uh, Ukrainian region where uh, the cave region would be the Poltava uh, style that she, she showed in the, the other slide. The importance of embroidery in cultural and religious life. The Ukrainian spirit is expressed in the ancient traditional embroideries. Here we have a beautiful example of the Ukrainian national folk costume. Uh, they are unique by region, but of course every one of them has the uh, embroidery and uh, that, that ties, ties this uh, tradition throughout the entire uh, uh, nation. Here we have uh, the special dance of greeting, a welcome uh, dance. And um, it's performed on stage, but also the welcoming of important dignitaries, important people that are guests would be uh, um, greeted uh, carrying the uh, beautiful Ukrainian uh, bread on the embroidery, the rushnik, as a ceremony. Uh, this is a, a long-held tradition that we still keep today. Uh, the dancers, uh, of course, use the rushnik as part of their dance after the actual greeting to the audience. Um, and the beautiful music and the, the veneration of the beauty of our rushnik, the ceremonial cloth. Here we have an example of Ukrainian embroidery in our churches, where, um, of course, from the very beginning of Christianity in Ukraine, the embroidery of churches and ecclesiastical embroidery of uh, the um, uh, of the priest vestments. And I only have these two small photographs. This is the church in Perth Amboy, where a small side altar, you see the embroidery at the top and at the bottom of the altar cloth. Uh, banners in church also have uh, traditional Ukrainian embroidery. Uh, here we have um, a picture of a certain a very uh, a particular style of uh, embroidery and weaving of rushnike from the central part of Ukraine. Um, once again, ceremonial, ritual, and ornamental purposes are, are, are um, in use for our rushnike. They can be embroidered or they could be woven. And I'll speak about this particular style of embroidery later. Returning to the Rushnike, Rushnike like these and many, many other beautiful examples are actually on exhibit at the Baron Arts Center uh, July 1st through August 27th of 2021. Uh, you will be absolutely amazed when you walk into the gallery the beauty of this artwork. Here we have in our homes, we, we adorn our religious icons with the Rushnik. And these are samples of embroidered rushnike that we would use both at home or in ceremonial use. 
Here we see an example of a wedding rushnik. Uh, the rushnik in a wedding ceremony is used in many different contexts. The hands of the bride and groom during the, uh, the ceremony are tied with a rushnik that is a precious gift from, uh, the, uh, from the family uh, to the bride and groom. Uh, they kneel or stand on a rushnik during their wedding vows. Uh, the, the rushnik is carried uh, with icons into the church uh, as they process uh, to take their vows. And um, there are different symbols that are used on the rushnik for weddings. This one in particular has uh, the flowers that are typical for a wedding, signifying love and devotion. On this rushnik, we have the peacocks, which also symbolize fertility and uh, good fortune for the, for the bride and groom. This is an example of how even today we have the traditional wedding bread decorated uh, and held on the rushnik and uh, it will be uh, presented to the bride and groom, the, married, the young married couple when they come into the reception and they will be greeted by the staroste, the elders that were chosen by the bride and groom to greet them and, and as their first greeting as husband and wife to the community uh, at the reception. So you see the, the, um, the wedding bread and the beautiful rushnik that was made specifically for the bride and groom. And here, actually, this is uh, my late husband and I at my son's wedding and his staroste. And there, there is my son, and there are my son and daughter-in-law uh, being greeted at their wedding reception as husband and wife. And the beautiful tradition of both the wedding bread, which is shared with uh, the, the guests at the end of the wedding, and the beautiful rushnik. Embroidery is the most practiced of Ukrainian folk arts. It's beautiful and varied motifs are reflected in, in our pisanke, the gerdane, wood carving, wood inlay, ceramics, and weaving ta and tapestries. Here I have a, a collection of pisanke, which were done in each of these you know, different styles of folk arts uh, from throughout Ukraine. On the very left is a, a ceramic pisanke done in a hutzel style, uh, moving to the right from the ceramic. Uh, pesanka. We have um, a hand uh, carved and inlaid wood pesanka. Then we have a wood carved and painted. Once again, all of these are folk arts uh, throughout uh, in Ukraine. And then the next pesanka is the Petrikyuka art, which is hand painted on a wooden egg. And we also have beautiful um, Petrikyuka art um, paintings hanging in the gallery at Baron Arts along with the Rushnike exhibit. Uh, that's presently there. Then the, the, ver the egg on the very right is hand painted. Then the egg in the center is actually etched. So that brings us to this, uh, let's say, this century of art because this is a new, new form of making pisanke by etching the egg in, in several stages, uh, starting with a brown egg. And then as it's etched in a solution, uh, the, the, uh, the egg surface uh, washes away, and then the whiteness uh, gives you the background. And once again, all of those uh, beautiful um, traditional embroidery and uh, pesanke motifs are carried on. Here we have the Trapillion style of art, both in a pisanka you see on the left, and then a ceramic and embroidery. Here we see uh, the wood carving, the sty different styles of wood carving. Uh, on the left is the wood carved and painted uh, platter. Uh, then we have wood inlay on the right, and then a selection of both carving and wood, uh, wood carving and painted in the center giving examples of beautiful motifs. Here we have a bride uh, from the, uh, the western region of Ukraine, uh, from Borshchu. And uh, we, will, we will see blouses like this later to look at and her headpiece to look at uh, closer. This headpiece is from the collection of Vasil Naida, who has exhibited some of his, his curated works uh, at the Ukrainian Museum. Um, if you can look 
closely, there are bands of embroidered beads, seed bead embroidery. This is called girdan, uh, or uh, strung seed bead work. So you have bands of these embroideries put together in a headpiece for the bride the morning of the wedding. Each of them are, are separate pieces, and they're tied in the back. Uh, and then ribbons flow from the back, and the very center of the headpiece in the back has flowers. Uh, so th this work that is done in preparation for a young girl's wedding starts way before the wedding when she's a young girl. They begin um, embroidering their Ukrainian blouses, the rushnike that will be part of the wedding ceremony and will be gifts to uh, the family of the bride and groom. And this is a beautiful piece of, of um, head, headwear that Vasil Naida has, um, has collected and found in Ukraine. These hats, too, are the bands. Uh, these are men's hats. The bands are also made of the strung bead um, uh, style of Gerdane, once again using the motifs of uh, embroidery. These are the Gerdane that are worn, which I'm actually wearing a Gerdan today. Uh, there are many different styles, and uh, they all reflect the embroidery patterns that have been handed down to us over the ages. And there's an endless amount of contemporary adaptation to all of these uh, um, art forms and folk arts and uh, naturally our, our uh, embroidery motifs some of which are right here. The picture on the left is little Olga on the left and then my cousin Margie uh, standing next to me with my aunt and uncle. This is my aunt Anna, who of course is the person who taught me to do pest and can to embroider. These were actually our first Ukrainian embroideries uh, that she embroidered for us. Now we see modern embroideries. Uh, once again, they're not, uh, they are typical Ukrainian embroideries, but obviously uh, artistically created uh, uh, for um, modern styles of dress and vary from evening wear to uh, suits and, and casual wear today. And once again, we're going to look at treasured embroideries. And I couldn't help but put up these beautiful dancers in their national folk costumes. Here I'll highlight uh, the beautiful embroidered blouses from the exhibit that the, uh, our uh, Ukrainian National Women's League of America uh, produces. Um, here we have um, a most of these photographs are by uh, Walter Kassian, once again, who works on has worked on his own embroidery of his Ukrainian shirt. Uh, he these are uh, embroideries that he has photographed for us. Beautiful sleeve. And uh, this, the sleeve on a Ukrainian women, woman's shirt can have three, uh, three parts to the embroidery. It can have the, the bottom of the sleeve coming up with one style of uh, embroidery, and its meaning would be the, the earliest time of, of a young girl's life. And then across the armband would be another, another part of her life is, is pictured or represented. This is a beautiful embroidery on a fine linen. Uh, here we have, uh, once again, the sleeve of a, a beautiful embroidery. These are all heirloom embroideries. These can date back to even 100 years uh, in, in personal collections of our members. Uh, this, this embroidery shows an oak leaf, and, um, which signifies strength and power. These two beautiful Ukrainian uh, women's shirts are uh, the, where you can see uh, the sleeve and the front of the shirt. Uh, the sleeve, uh, if you notice, the sleeve is embroidered on the cuff, around the neck, and the front of the chest. So both in women's embroidered shirts and men's embroidered shirts, this is the long-standing custom because these were um, talismanic signs. These were signs of protection around the neck, protecting the chest and, and the being, the person, and around the, the cuff. All of this was meant circling. Encircling means protection and etern eternity. 
here we have a beautiful example of a sleeve. Once again, this is an old embroidery dating back over, um, uh, over 50 years old. And this is an example of, of the traditional Ukrainian shirt where it is body length and uh, tied at the waist with a woven, uh, traditional woven um, sash, hand woven sash and the beautiful embroidery, the squares or a diamond pattern uh, signify the uh, four corners of the earth. Uh, it would signify uh, the, uh, the field, uh, the fields that are, are going to grow with bounty uh, to support uh, the family. Once again, a beautiful embroidery with roses in black and, and red, uh, a, a typical central Ukraine uh, color scheme and um, design. Once again, roses on the sleeve of the shirt where you have across the arm in, at the top and then down the arm to the cuff uh, with embroidery. Roses, of course, signify love and devotion and faith. Now this embroidery is um, not cross-stitch embroidery, which is most common in Ukraine. This is a free, freehand style of embroidery with many, many different stitches coming together in a single color or two colors, red and black. This is the old, one of the oldest uh, styles of stitch work. There were hundreds of different stitches in, uh, across Ukraine. And um, when cross-stitch came to, um, to Ukraine about in the 17th century, uh, then cross-stitch was um, adapted to both floral uh, patterns as well as geometric patterns. But of course, this style of embroidery is still very popular in Ukraine and is um, uh, originally from the central part of Ukraine. The Ukrainian rushnike that, that I showed you that were done in red are embroidered with this type of embroidery, which we will look at closer in other um, pictures. Here we have uh, uh, another embroidery that is the, uh, a weaving uh, stitch, not a cross stitch or obviously not uh, freehand. This is a close-up of Poltava. Uh, stitches on a linen uh, fabric w in, um, in white thread. So it's a white on white pattern that is very typical of the Poltava region embroidery. And once again, a close up of a sleeve with the bottom of the sleeve showing the, the tree of life and, uh, and then across the band across th the top of the sleeve. This is a beautiful example of many Ukrainian blouses. You see the sleeves from the Borshchu uh, area. This is the, the same um, embroidery style of the wedding of the bride that I showed you earlier. And these are pictures from the Ukrainian Museum exhibit. The blouse on the left is the sleeve from the Podilia region. It is, uh, the cloth is of hemp and the threads are wool embroidered very, very thick, close together. If you see specks of color, those are seed beads uh, sewn into the embroidery to give color and, and of course they glisten from a distance. Um, modern embroidery today is done in all seed beads. You do the, the patterns and the designs that are traditional, but in, in all the colored beads. And those are beautiful embroideries and a new, new technique using uh, them to do an entire embroidery where before they were used uh, here and there within an embroidery. The blouse on the right is from the Hutsul region. Many colors, they are known for their, their colorful embroideries and very fine technique. This is the, the style of the stitches is called niz. It's embroidered from the back and we'll explore that later in close-ups. Once again, we have a bride and groom in their wedding finery. And uh, we have on the right a Hutzel man uh, dressed in, in the uh, region's uh, jacket, which is called a kiptar. It's embroidered and embellished and uh, appliqued 
uh, with many different materials uh, on a, a lamb's wool uh, a sleeveless jacket, the kiptar. And once again, beautiful embroideries and costumes. Again, all the embroidery and the, the different styles from the regions are exemplified here. The photograph on the right is from a fashion show that uh, the Natalia Dance School um, gave a performance of dances and then the fashion show of Ukrainian uh, regional embroidery uh, costumes. We move on to types of embroidery stitches. Now this, of course, is an example of cross stitch. Here a very good close-up of how you count threads. You, the, you need to be embroidering on fabric that has even weave in order for you to count two, two of the threads lengthwise, widthwise, and uh, two across, two down would create a perfect, uh, perfectly executed uh, individual cross stitch. And of course, as I said, this is the most used and most common now of stitches in Ukraine and Ukrainian embroidery. Uh, here we have a sample of a pattern. If I were to embroider from something, I would embroider from a pattern like this that's been pre-printed and has the, uh, the, uh, the numbers, the names and the numbers of the colors that are used in the embroidery. Another way that we embroider is from one another's embroideries. Oh, I love your pillow. Can I, can I copy this? So I would take the pillow home and I would begin a portion of it so that I would have the entire embroidery to continue. I'd give my, my aunt back her pillow and I would continue embroidering mine. Here we have examples of the types of material that we use, fabrics that we use for counted stitch embroidery. The fabrics have perfectly even threads running crosswise and lengthwise. And when you're embroidering, you are counting the threads and then going through the holes. You don't touch the thread itself. You go, your needle goes through the hole, in and out of holes as you count the number of threads. When uh, using fabric that is fine, uh, like for instance my blouse today, this, this is a very fine uh, fabric that you couldn't count the threads to make even stitches, then you apply the waste canvas to the, the fabric, you baste it down securely, and then you use the threads of the waste uh, uh, canvas to count your two threads across or two threads down and so on uh, as you embroider. When you're finished your embroidery, you pull those threads away and then your actual embroidery shows up on the fabric. Here we have uh, originally um, what the ancients used. Their fabrics were wool, uh, homegrown uh, flax and hemp uh, was spun and made into both material and then yarn and threads to use for sewing and embroidering. Um, on their own home woven fabrics. Um, bleaching, originally they, they also bleached either the fabric or the threads or both, whichever they wanted, so that uh, early uh, embroidery, uh, uh, if they didn't have any type of dyeing technique, they were embroidering white on white or a bleached thread on a, a non-bleached fabric which would give you some contrast and we still call that white on white. And that is uh, very popular in the Poltava region embroideries. And as natural sources were discovered in order to dye fabric and threads, these of course increased over time as to the, the designs and the, the variation and inclusion of many colors, the threads in their embroidery work. Gold and silver threads were used. Uh, we know that from the excavations that have been done in, in Kiev and uh, the uh, fabrics that were uncovered in sarcophaguses. Uh, they used um, the gold and silver threads that were laid on the fabric and then uh, embroidered over to secure them to the fabric. Um, glass beads were used, um, uh, seed beads and sequins also were used in uh, ornamentation of uh, embroideries. Here we have the example of how we apply the um, 
the waste canvas. This is a, a little, a, a child's little dress and the yoke, I embroidered the yoke with a, a simple design. And uh, once I finish my embroidery, I take the basting out and then I start tugging on lengthwise and crosswise threads and pull them out from under the embroidery. And the whole point of when you're doing this embroidery, you cannot catch the waste canvas because then you won't be able to pull it out. It comes out from under the cross stitching that you embroidered. Now, time intensive, as I said, this is the blouse that I'm wearing today uh, was made for me in Ukraine when I came to visit my cousins. They, they spent three months, in, she, uh, my cousin Daria embroidered this uh, before I came and she was still embroidering when I was there. They finished sewing it the last day, sewing it together. Her sister-in-law sewed the blouse um, the day that we were leaving and I, I, I've cherished it ever since. But uh, imagine the work that went into the, the the um, embroidering on waste canvas is more difficult than embroidering on material that you see clearly see the threads and, and the spaces that you, you put your needle through. So this was really a, a labor of love. The Poltava region, uh, th these are several samples of uh, the different types of embroideries of the Poltava region stitches. They use a satin stitch we call Lishtva, cut work, is Virizovanya. Uh, we have the satin stitch which secures the cut work also. They use that to embroider that together. Uh, drawn needlework is Tiahuvanya and then we have uh, Merashka which is cut and drawn. And now we'll see close-ups of these and these stitches. Um, I'll take you first to the right hand side. If you look at the corner right hand, top right hand, we see step one. This is where you use the, uh, the overcast uh, stitch um, to secure the outline of the design. If you go down to step two, which is the lower right, of the blue embroidery, you will see that there are uh, threads that have actually been cut out. They can be cut out because the blue embroidery has already secured the rest of the fabric. And then we go on to step three, which is in the very, very center of this blue embroidery. Um, the darkest blue embroidery is where you create the pattern in cut work. Um, uh, uh, you go over the, the threads that are left and create designs uh, around those threads and inside the spaces that are left as well. On the left hand side we have, and once again these are Potava region, uh, very specialized embroidery stitches that they are famous for. Uh, cut and drawn work, Merashka, is at the very very top of the um, the left hand side and you'll see that there are two threads kind of dangling so what you do is you pick them up and pull them out and you release that area of threads then you use the crosswise stitches to gather you know to the remaining stitches to gather and use many different types of stitches to pull and create a design uh, some of which you can see at the bottom of, of that left hand sample absolutely beautiful work and um, very exacting. Here we have more examples of cut work at the top and at the bottom is the merashka. If you look at a large piece of merashka, you might think that it's lace, but Ukrainians don't make lace. We, we do the merashka and, and it can look as beautiful and fine as lace does. And here we have master artist, um, the late uh, Helen Dobush, with whom I had uh, my apprenticeship with in Poltava region embroidery. And um, it was a privilege and a pleasure to work with her. She was delightful. She has uh, had embroidered from being a young child. She was too young to learn to embroider, everyone told her, when the women would get together to embroider in the evenings. Uh, the children would be running around watching and the older girls would start, they would be taught to embroider. And she wanted to be taught to embroider and no one would, would take the time because she was too young. She's too young, you have to wait, wait till you're older. She started on her own without help and picked up what they were, were 
were learning, what they were doing. She watched her mother and the other women embroidering and picked up the embroidery on her own. So they teased her that she was born with a needle in her hand. This is a close-up of the back of, of the bride's wedding gown. Uh, Helen Dalbush embroidered this for her. Uh, she has two panels of Menashka embroidery on her gown. Um, and this close-up shows just how talented and skilled uh, Helen Dalbush was in, in her embroidery. If you see, you see this is a very fine silk chiffon. And if you look closely at the very top on the right hand side, you'll see that there are tr threads that have been pulled and how fine those threads are and how fine the threads, the crosswise threads that are left are. You can't count these threads. This has to be done just by your eye. I'm picking up this many threads in order to create this design on this level, this row. Uh, so, and, and the perfection of her, her uh, embroidery here is just phenomenal. This she embroidered for her, grand ch her daughter uh, for baptism and used for her grandchildren for baptism. This is cut and drawn work. Here is her, a collection of her embroidered pillows in her living room. If you notice, uh, the two pillows on the left have a blue background and a red background. That's not red embroidery or blue embroidery. It is white on white embroidery with cut work. So all the cut work shows uh, has, is the opening that shows the pillow uh, case that is either red or blue underneath it. And so you get the contrast of colors and the beauty of the cut work is uh, uh, emphasized by whatever background uh, material is under it. Uh, we have another pillow of, of Helen Dobosch's uh, in the, the, the uh, Poltava style. Here we see the dyed threads already uh, coming to be. They used ash to create uh, a gray dye and a very uh, fine uh, light gray and uh, the blue dye. So we see the embroidery of the satin stitch, the lishtha, and then we also see the cut work in white uh, in this particular embroidery. Here we have silk threads on a fine fabric. Um, your threads will usually be thicker than the material that you're embroidering on. Uh, here we have, in, in this embroidery, we have medashka in the bands going horizontally at the top, the center, and the bottom. Uh, we have the cut work where you can see the blue background showing through. And then we have the lishtva, the satin stitch, creating that beautiful design that the light bounces off of the threads that are, are, are embroidered in different, um, uh, in different ways. So they're either crosswise or lengthwise or horizontal. And then it gives you that sheen and, and depth to that design. Here we have um, uh, cotton uh, threads embroidered on uh, um, uh, also a, a light uh, color fabric, white on white. Uh, we have little um, nightingale's eyes, is what we call eyelets in Ukrainian. Um, so this is considered open work because all, all those stitches create an opening in the center of the fabric. And then again, the lishtva uh, creating those, uh, uh, the designs within the squares and triangles. Uh, now we're going to explore the different types of uh, embroidery stitches throughout Ukraine. Um, needless to say, in modern times, all of these uh, types of uh, stitches, whether cross stitch or the Poltava region stitches, uh, are used by people who, who love them and, and want to uh, learn them and, and make their embroideries in those, uh, those stitches. Uh, the Yavoryuka stitch uh, actually originated in the town of Yavoryuka in Western Ukraine. Beautiful uh, geometric pattern. And here is a close-up of how this is counted. Obviously not cross-stitch. This is a flat stitch uh, done in increments of uh, four, two, two or four um, lengths of, of, um, of thread. And you're counting four down and two across. So that uh, you, you see how the pattern um, progresses at an angle. That is Yavuryuka. 
here, this is a weaving stitch that is absolutely phenomenal, very, very complicated to do, difficult to do. My Aunt Lesha did do a niz. She tried to teach me, and I, I tried my hand at it, it very uh, intense, and I, I really, I, I just didn't continue. I, I kept with my yaburiuka and cross stitch. But this is a sample of the pattern that you would follow to do niz. The word niz means uh, underneath, beneath. And so what you're doing is you're embroidering. You see th this woman embroidering on the back of the embroidery so that she can see the threads. The front of the embroidery, which you'll see in a second, has the thicker pattern and, and colors where the, the back is lighter in color and easier to work from. That's why it's called niz and um, you follow that particular pattern or someone else's embroidery to count your stitches. This is a true woven stitch. You weave down the fabric, come to the end of your design, turn around, and then start weaving your design, embroidering your design up. And then again, you turn around and, and come down. So this is a true woven um, style of stitch. And here is a completed. This niz embroidered from the wrong, you see it, it's been embroidered from the wrong side and the top is the example of the wrong side of the embroidered piece. At the bottom is your sample of niz, the finished right side that you're looking at. Now it's beautiful just as it is. You see the richness of the design and how, how uh, heavier the design is than, than the right the wrong side where you can count the stitches and see the threads uh, as you're working. Now this is beautiful as it is or and of course when you do more uh, detailed work then you add color to the spaces and in some cases there is no white showing through it is all in beautiful color uh, of threads and design. And here I'm showing you more, more of uh, embroideries in the style of Niz stitches. Uh, it is a solid stitch embroidered from the back. It is a counted stitch. Beautiful from front and back. The more expert you are in embroidering, you will not see where one <coughs> length of thread ends and then you have to re-thread and start another uh, thread. <coughs> we don't, in Ukrainian embroidery, we don't use knots. Um, and so the back of this niz that you can see on the right is absolutely, absolute perfection. Uh, again, more samples of niz, nizinka. We also call this nizinka. Um, the yellow and the green at the bottom uh, is a braided stitch. And here we have the back. At the very top, you'll see the back and uh, the front of uh, Zavartani niz, which is an even finer uh, style of niz embroidery, must be done from the back again. And you see the, the depth of color and the intensity of, of the design is, is just unbelievable. Now, this was embroidered by someone in my family that is not such an expert as in the previous pictures, the black. You'll see there are no threads. You don't see where threads, one starts and another begins. This is perfection. <laughs> now, um, this is the back of this is still beautiful, but obviously the front is spectacular. And here we we see a close up of Walter Cassian's to the two embroidered shirts that uh, he his mother embroidered for him. And as a child, as a young a young teenager, he uh, was able to embroider, wanted to embroider the colors in this. And and on the left, you see a close up of this. And this, of course, is Niz. And here is still another close-up of a very similar pattern to Walter's shirt. And you'll notice here the white is not the background of the material. It is actually an embroidered white thread. And here is the scarf uh, that I have. So the front of the scarf and the back, how beautiful it looks, and then the close-up of this beautiful stitch. Here we have a... a, a Nastelyovanya, uh, which is a flat stitch, but it has the effect of having been woven. 
We'll go through a, a selection of regional embroidery designs and patterns that follow the map of Ukraine. If you can picture uh, the map of Ukraine, uh, uh, we're looking at the Black Sea to the west of the Black Sea, the Cauca the um, the mountains, and um, the Carpathian Mountains in the west. The very southwest are the Carpathian Mountains, and we're going to move north of the Carpathian Mountains. Uh, we'll move into the center north of Ukraine, the map of Ukraine, to the center where Cave and the the, um, uh, the breadbasket of Ukraine. And then we move to we will move to the west of Ukraine and around and back. Uh, to south, uh, to the southern part, central southern part of Ukraine in these uh, examples of uh, embroidery. Now, obviously, there are just so many. You couldn't typify a region by just these little samples that I'm giving you because there is just an endless amount of creativity and artistry in the embroideries of these regions to this day. Uh, but th this gives you an idea of the, the s slight differences that you will notice in these uh, patterns and designs. Uh, we have once again a few examples of uh, Yavuriu, uh, Yavuriuka from the Yavur region and uh, town. Uh, we have um, many uh, many types of flat uh, uh, flat stitches used in many different ways to create beautiful patterns. We've moved from the Carpathian Mountains in the very, very southwest of, of Ukraine on the map. We moved upwards uh, above, north of the Carpathian Mountains. And now we're in Volyn, which is central Ukraine, but still east. We're moving eastward into uh, the center east of Ukraine, and that would be Volyn. Beautiful embroideries. Examples of beautiful embroidery from Podilia, which is central Ukraine, um, s still on the east, the eastern half of Ukraine. And as we move to the west, we're getting into the Poltava region. Kiev, our capital of Kiev, Poltava, and their beautiful embroideries. And once again, uh, we are still in the uh, Poltava region, central, upwards north, central uh, part of Ukraine, getting closer to the west, to actually the western part of Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> these are, uh, once again, on the left is an example of a rushnik uh, embroidered in red. And uh, obviously, we have a beautiful close-up of the red embroidery and all the different styles of stitches that they used so creatively in order to give depth and, and uh, uh, um, detail to the embroidery, being that it's done in only one color. Now, there are reasons why the, the red thread was used. First, it was the first dye that was available. Uh, they used black, they used red, and then other colors came into being. Uh, but another reason to use the red thread is for those people who couldn't afford beautiful colors once colored threads were available to purchase, um, those people were too poor to buy those threads in color and they continued and uh, embroidered in, in all one color in red in all those beautiful st uh, styles, types of stitch work. This brings us to the Donetsk uh, region, which is western Ukraine, in the uh, the south, southwestern Ukraine, Donetsk, and we we swing around uh, the lower part, the southern part of Ukraine, will take us to the um, Zaporizhia, uh, and if you can picture the Black Sea, the Crimean Peninsula, this would be north of the border of the Black Sea on in Ukraine. And this is Zaporizhia, again, uh, beautiful florals, uh, red and black, typical for that region of embroidery. The region of Kherson brings us to the end of our, our picture uh, uh, trip across Ukraine. Uh, Kherson is the southernmost uh, uh, ethnographical region of uh, Ukraine on the southern border with the Black Sea. 
And so we end this lecture with these beautiful photographs of, of uh, Ukrainian embroidery. I hope that you love the embroidery of Ukraine and that you've discovered new things and possibly even something of your own heritage. Uh, maybe you'll be interested in even embroidering, doing Ukrainian embroidery. Uh, be sure to view uh, what Baron Art Center has uh, on virtual, the virtual exhibits, our Ukrainian embroideries of, of the Ukrainian National Women's League of America and the gallery exhibits of uh, Ukrainian art and Ukrainian antique and heirloom uh, beautiful Rushnike. Um Thank you very much for your attention. And we, I do have one more thing I want to share with you. Uh, we will go on to the uh, credits and information that might be helpful to you. My inspiration for doing research in Ukrainian embroidery and uh, um, applying for the grant with master artist, the late uh, Helen Dobosh, would be listed in the credits. Uh, Lyubov Volinec, who is curator of folk art at the Ukrainian Museum in New York City. I, uh, I have seen her work and been to her lectures and classes myself and, and have been uh, very inspired by her. Uh, Vira Nakonechny of Philadelphia. She is a uh, many award winning uh, an embroidery and textile artist and curator uh, who inspires my, my research and my work. Uh, Vasil Naida, who is a curator of beautiful the heirloom uh, headwear and weavings that, that I showed you a bit of. Um, he, he is a young man who is is a collector, curator of works from Western uh, Ukraine uh, and researcher. The photos in my exhibit, uh, beautiful photos of all the embroideries in our exhibit are by Walter Kassian and I've utilized Ihor Chmola both for, for his map and uh, for the embroidery photographs. His book is Beauty of Ukrainian Embroidery uh, and the other books, Ukrainian Embroidery by Kmit, uh, Ukrainian Folk Costume, um, um, printed by the World Federation of Ukrainian Women's Organizations. On the internet, you can go to the Encyclopedia of Ukraine, uh, proudofukraine.com, uh, for symbols of Ukrainian embroidery, which I didn't get into. Uh, they are many and varied, and we would have to pick through the, the embroideries to look for those symbols. Uh, a nice place to find the meanings of the symbols is proudofukraine.com. And this ends my presentation. Um, please do visit the Baron Art Center. Bye.